In this year, 954, in a certain lonely place called Stainmore, King Eric was treacherously betrayed and killed, along with his son Harek and his brother Ragnald. From then on, King Edred of Wessex ruled in these parts north of the Humber. And from that time to the present, the Northumbrians have been subject to the Southern English and have grieved for want of a king of their own and for the liberty they once enjoyed. The search for Eric Bloodaxe is, to say the least, difficult, even though his life is intensely dramatic. Compared with Alfred the Great or William the Conqueror, it's very difficult to actually get close to the man himself, although he was the most famous Viking of them all. The search is made all the more difficult because there is no contemporary chronicle which tells of Eric's deeds. And so, if we wish to recreate those days when Eric ruled as the last of the kings of the Northumbrians. We need to turn detective. We need to piece together the lost chronicle of the Northumbrians which once existed and told of his deeds. And that chronicle can only now be recovered from fragments quoted by other writers. And that's why I've come here to Howden on the southern fringe of Northumbria. Howden is one of the forgotten gems among English small towns. In Anglo-Saxon times, it was the administrative center of a really enormous group of royal estates. And it was because the place was so important then that, small as it is today, it still has a really huge Minster church. Now, it was in this church, in about the year 1200, 250 years after Eric Bloodaxe's death, that the writer Roger of Howden compiled a work of history. And in that book, is the real clue to the career of Eric Bloodaxe, because Roger incorporated undigested parts of an earlier work into his own history. And that earlier work was different in complexion from every other chronicle of the period, because it was pro-Viking. It ended with a tone of deep regret with the death of Eric Bloodaxe, and it spoke for the independent voice of ancient Northumbria. In the 10th century, Northumbria was a huge semi-Christianized kingdom whose wild hills were populated by a mixture of English, Celts, Danes and Norse. Up here they spoke a different dialect of English and their custom and law were distinct. The southerners thought them turbulent and lawless, but as always, the southerners were biased. For in the 940s, the southern English successors of King Athelstan claimed to rule all England, while the Northumbrians still hankered after home rule north of the Humber. In the mid-10th century, Northumbria still stretched from the Humber to the Forth. Great areas of the Borders and Lothian, although settled by Scots, were still under Northumbrian rule. Further to the south, Yorkshire had been part of the original Danish settlements of Alfred the Great's time, and here a mixed Anglo-Scandinavian society had developed, which saw its future differently from the rest of England. York was the political and economic hub of the North. Center of a seaborne trade stretching to Scandinavia, Ireland, and as far as Central Asia. In the 10th century, there were few more exciting places to be. York was an electric transformer, ceaselessly stirring up men's lives, a racial melting pot with money, commerce, and individualism.
York, said a 10th century writer, was still distinguished by its impressive facade, surrounded by Roman walls that are now disused and decayed. But it still rejoices in its multitude of peoples, not less than 30,000 adults, indescribably rich, filled with the wares of merchants from all parts, particularly from the Danes. In this atmosphere, a Latin chronicle of York was written as propaganda for the Viking kings in the north. And where better to imagine it than a cold upstairs room in a great 10th century church, which Eric Bloodaxe knew. The Lost Chronicle of York was written in a room just like this one. This is the oldest room in York. It's in the church of St. Mary Bishop Hill, a great 10th century Anglo-Saxon church which flourished at the time of Eric Bloodaxe with a congregation of well-to-do Anglo-Vikings, men of wealth and taste. The Chronicle would also have been written by a churchman because only churchmen could write. They had a monopoly over written propaganda. And it was also surely written under the supervision of the enigmatic Archbishop of York, Wolfstan. Wolfstan was an inveterate northerner. He ruled the roost here for 25 years like a prince bishop, standing for independent Viking Northumbria. And to him, Eric Bloodaxe represented a return to the good old days. Bloodaxe gave the Northumbrians a king of their own, a king to set beside the glorious kings of Northumbrian history. And he was a far better bet to Wolfstan than a king from London. That's an opinion which you can still find in Yorkshire today. The Chronicle would have been written then from the point of view of the Viking kings. It told of their alliances, their marriages, and it even used Scandinavian words, Latinized, to match the kind of speech that happened in the street of York. How do we know all this when the Chronicle is now lost? Well, a whole series of often much later writers uh, give us nuggets of detail that could only have been written down in the 10th century. So what I've done here is to put all those little nuggets together and try and reconstruct the history of the ancient Northumbrians as it might have been written down in the 10th century. It's simply a matter of, of Xeroxing those passages and putting them together in chronological order and uh, Here it is. This is the Chronicle of the Northumbrians and it enables us to look at the career of Eric Bloodaxe uh, in detail for the first time In 947 said the Chronicle the Northumbrians set up as king over themselves a certain man of North royal line called Eric In the summer of that year Eric appeared with a fleet in the mouth of the Humber. Former king of Norway, Eric had been inured to battle since his teens when he fought by the White Sea in the north of Russia. There his ruthless bravery had earned him the nickname Blood Axe. Now exiled by his own people for his brutality, he was on the lookout for a stage and a kingdom. At this very time, the Northumbrians had agreed to meet the new King of England, Edred, and acknowledge his rule. Here, at the royal village of Tanshire, somewhere on the historic hill where Pontefract now stands. Perhaps these events took place where the great Norman castle was later erected. The bloody prison of Pomfret, fatal and ominous, where Richard II was murdered. Here, Archbishop Wolfstan and the Northumbrian Council agreed to accept southern rule. But this decision was immediately turned on its head by the arrival of Eric. The Northumbrians quickly made him king. The wealth of Eric's York flowed in from the sea. Here, wide-bellied merchant ships unloaded goods from Norway and Ireland. Here, on the quays of the River Ouse, were the warehouses of Viking dealers. Above the waterfront, squalid streets were packed with craftsmen's tenements, teeming with industry. Here, on Joiner's Street, Coppergate, a major excavation behind the shop front has opened a fascinating window on the world of Eric Bloodaxe. 
Richard Hall has now reached the Virgin River clay. Uh, uh, now that you're through those layers, what, what is the basic impression that you've got out of this site for mid-10th century York? The fact that it was a very bustling, thriving city, very densely built up, there were buildings packed along that street frontage, side by side, you'd hardly walk between them. They were utilising that street because it was one of the main streets in the city, a place where traders and merchants were living and working and a place of great richness. Um, this wasn't a subsistence economy, this was a place where we found lots of jewellery lying around where it had been discarded. We found silver pennies in the floor levels of the buildings. We found objects that had been traded into the city from as far afield as the east end of the Mediterranean and beyond. So really, it was a place of, of great wealth and opulence. It must have been a very thriving, busy place. And uh, uh, you actually found evidence of merchant and commercial activity on this site? Absolutely, yes. Um, in particular, we found evidence for a section of the community whose names we knew already, but whose uh, operations really haven't been found archaeologically. That's the moneyers of the Viking Age city. Some of the leading citizens, the people who must have been embroiled in the power politics of the time, the people who were appointed to look after the coinage by kings such as Eric. What do you know about their activities now? Well, now we can see the sort of buildings that they were operating in, and to our surprise, uh, their premises are very much like the other ones that we've got up there on the front. They're wooden buildings by our standards. They'd be very slum-like, not even a plank on the floor, just earth floors. And yet in that, they were making the dyes for producing the coinage and also striking the silver pennies, which were the basis of York's prosperity. How big a part of the economy was coinage? Do we know, have we any idea yet? Well, we know that there was a silver coinage here right through the 10th century, that it was started in York by the Vikings, and that with all the political comings and goings, the coinage continued. So we have this picture of a wealthy merchant class who carried on making an honest penny, no matter what was going on in power politics at the top. So they, they adapted to the shifts of regime, did they? Absolutely, yes. They would bend with a tie like the Vicar of Bray. They'd be happy to bend any way that, was, uh, that suited their business activities. And have you any idea, I know it's difficult from archaeological evidence alone, but have you any idea how a king like Blood Axe would have related with this kind of community? I mean, presumably, he would have had to be acceptable to those kind of men. Oh, but... very much so. He was the, the person who appointed them, but they, they had to, at least on the surface, owe allegiance to him. And I'm sure that he must have had around him a, a band of followers who he could rely on to put a word in the right ear and to say, this man, Eric, he's all right, you know, he, he's good for us, good for the town, good for trade, stick with him. Just how good Eric could be for the town is shown by the coins produced during his first rule. This is the standard Southern English style and could be easily exchanged by the York merchants who coasted down to East Anglia with their wares. On the reverse, the name of the York moneyer who minted the coin, Rathulf, perhaps one of York's wealthier citizens. Of the culture of such men, we have material survivals. This punched silver ring, the kind that Eric gave to such followers in return for their service. Poets praised the king as free with rings, or as they put it, Hawkstrand's gold shower. This brooch incorporates a coin of Valentinian, the Roman emperor, perhaps a talisman more than a conscious emulation of the classical past. It was a society where much ingenuity and wealth went into male adornment. This ring in particular shows the head of a man between wolves, a pagan motif, but also one referring to the martyrdom of St. Edmund a warrior saint much admired by Vikings. In the poetry of the 10th century which praises Eric, the images are harsh. The guardian of the land held sway beneath a helmet of fear, giving lavish gifts, stern-minded, he steadfastly ruled in the fortress of York over his sea-washed shores. But the southern king, Edred, could not countenance Eric's rule in the north. The next summer, he led a great mounted expedition north of the Humber to overthrow Eric and bring the troublesome northerners to heel. Then, says the lost chronicle, he burned down their cities, destroyed their forts, and arrested suspects, devastating much of Northumbria. 
and in that ravaging, the glorious minster which St. Wilfred built at Ripon was burned down. Archaeologists have pieced together a few clues about Saxon Ripon. The 7th century church stood on this little hill, surrounded by wooden hovels and protected by a palisade and ditch. Above ground, there are few signs today. Just these fragments of the Saxon church incorporated into the Norman walls. But they are not the whole story. There is one part of the glorious minster of St. Wilfred at Ripon which still survives today. And this is it. This is the crypt dedicated by St. Wilfred in 672. It was built in order to house the relics, the bones of saints, which would have been kept in caskets in little niches in the wall like these and illuminated by candlelight. So this was one of the most famous and venerated places of Christianity in England. Why was it destroyed in 948? It may have been an accident, but it's more likely that it was done deliberately by the southerners because they saw Ripon as one of the centers of Northumbrian separatism, of Northumbrian independent feeling. And there are a few clues which have come up recently which could back that up. A few years ago, a bishop of Ripon decided to smash a hole through this unique monument in order to open it up for the passage of modern pilgrims, tourists, to see the cathedral treasures. And in the earth fill outside this crypt, destruction debris was discovered, probably from the burning of this church in 948, in the war with Eric Bloodaxe. And chief among the pieces that turned up was this. This is a crosshead from the old Viking Age cemetery of Ripon. And although obviously it's a Christian monument, it carries a pagan Viking theme. There, if you can make him out, is the figure of the hero Sigurd sucking his burned thumb, having killed the dragon Fafnir. Now this would have been a fairly expensive and elaborate commission, and it suggests the kind of wealthy patrons of the Church of Ripon, Vikings, who might also have been backers of Eric Bloodaxe. There's another clue. At the time of the destruction, either before the church was destroyed or afterwards, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was with the southern army, came down into this crypt and removed the bones of St. Wilfred himself from one of these relic niches. The justification for this, he claimed, was to save them, to protect them from the innumerable political upheavals of our time, which sounds rather like the Russian justification of their aid for the people of Afghanistan. The real reason may have been that the southerners were trying to deprive the northerners of the spiritual backing of their most famous and warlike sect. If they were thinking that way, then they were to be sadly disillusioned. After the destruction of Ripon, Edred turned south, back down the Great North Road. The main obstacle for travellers and armies leaving Northumbria was the River Eyre at Castleford. Here the old Roman road crossed by a wide ford just above the weir and the modern bridge. It is a historic crossing. Here armies have passed for 2,000 years. Agricola, William the Conqueror, Edward IV. Here, Eric Bloodaxe planned his revenge. As yet, we do not know what was here in 948. So far, excavations have revealed only Roman levels, although a Saxon settlement is possible on the little hill where the church stands today. Here, at the narrow approach to the crossing, Eric waited in ambush with an army from York. He let King Edred cross with his main force. But when the rear guard approached the ford, he struck. Caught in line of march, 
Trapped between the river and blood axe, the English were overwhelmed and slaughtered to a man. It was the first time in half a century that the southerners had been beaten in battle. Eric's court poets were jubilant. Artist of war, wetter of sword play, they sang. Across the water leaps his fame. Enraged by this disaster, Edred announced he would return with a greater army and lay waste the whole of the north, unless the Northumbrians abandoned Eric and paid him compensation. They did. Late in 948, Eric set sail from York into exile. For the next four years, Eric vanishes from history. What did he do? Where did he go? He may have been king in the Western Isles for a while. He may have plundered in Wales. But he took the slave trade route to the Mediterranean, a pirate voyage to Spain, where there was a lucrative trade in British slaves in exchange for Arab silver with which he could pay his followers. If anywhere old salts on the Foss Quay in York could have told of the hazards of that sea voyage, there too they could tell of the treasures, the gold and silver, the fabulous silks and saddles, exquisite woven cloths of all kinds, satins and silks in scarlet and green. Perhaps then Eric agreed with the 10th century Viking writer who said, only the man who has traveled extensively and made far journeys can know and judge men of deep minds. Late in 952, a great battle rocked the world of Northern Britain. Somewhere on the wild verges of Northumbria, an alliance of Scots, Cumbrians and English from Bamburgh was heavily defeated by the Norse. Eric had returned. In the Cathedral Church of York, there was no hesitation in having him back. The flame of Northumbrian separatism was as ardent as ever. And Archbishop Wolfstan, now in his sixties, was as strong as ever in his support for any king who stood for Northern independence. The lost chronicle of the Northumbrians records Eric's return very briefly. 952. Here, Northumbre underfengon Eric Haroldus Sunu, an Anglo Saxon translation of the original Latin text. The Northumbrians took Eric, the son of Harold, as their king. Why had they done it? After all the trouble they'd had, especially with Eric, why bring him back? What went through the mind of Archbishop Wolfstan and his counselors when they sat on some day in 952 in an upstairs room like this one and decided how to receive Eric's request? After all, a few years before, they and the powerful commercial interest in York had abandoned Eric after the destruction of Ripon. But this time, uh, things were different. They must have known that the southern king, Eadred, in London was now a very sick man. And they probably tired of having a, a pro-Southern puppet up here. And they saw their chance to appoint a man who would build and keep an independent Northumbria once and for all. The coins now minted for Eric press home that idea. No mere copies of Southern coins. Now they proudly blazon Eric's name, coupled with a great sword. And as before, we know the names of the York citizens, English and Norse, who created these remarkable expressions of Eric's rule. Ingelgar, Rathulf, Leofrich, and here, Akulf. Down south, Eric's return was greeted with tight-lipped fury. Court rumor pointed the finger at Archbishop Wolfstan. 
So the next time the redoubtable churchman came south, he was arrested and incarcerated here in the lonely fortress of Yuthanbur, now Bradwell on Sea, on a marshy promontory on the northern tip of Essex. The walls of the former Roman station have now vanished. All that remains is the 7th century chapel of St. Chad. Here in this desolate place, for the whole period of Eric's second rule in York, Archbishop Wolfstan kicked his heels with seabirds for company. He was never to see his beloved north again. Why had Wolfstan and the Northern Church backed Eric for so long? Northumbrian Christianity had been one of the great glories of early Europe. In the Viking era, all had been swept away. Great churches like Lindisfarne were left sacked and roofless. Their monks were forced to wander the Northumbrian hills with their remaining books and the coffin of their founder, St. Cuthbert. Here in this vast countryside, the laws tell of pin-sticking and voodoo, spite poles, spell workers, magic runes and divinations. Stones were known to move and trees to speak. Out here, the priesthood was illiterate, worldly and polygamous. Here, beleaguered Christianity hung on at small local churches, tucked away in secluded valleys. Here by the river Weir, the ancient church at Eskham continued to be a house of God. The reason was probably the presence of a settled Viking population nearby who had been converted to Christianity, for it was where the church accommodated the invaders and their beliefs that Christianity could still flourish. Over the Pennines in the Cumbrian hills, the old English monasteries like Heversham and Erton, ended at this time, stripped of their land and treasures by the invaders, leaving their great standing crosses as the only visible sign. In the south, churchmen wrote that it was the twilight of Christianity in the north, but they were wrong, for a new Christianity was emerging. The meeting of Christian and pagan themes which it entailed is best seen at Gosforth in Cumbria, where a Dark Age masterpiece gives us more clues to Eric Bloodaxe's thought world. Richard Bailey of Newcastle University has made a special study of Viking Age crosses. Very few of them actually survive complete, except for this, which gives us an astonishing insight into the, the radical thinking that's going on in the 10th and 11th century. Because here you've got, you see, what looks like um, a straight Christian scene, a crucifixion uh, with Longinus and Mary Magdalene below. But everything else on that cross is taken straight from pagan mythology. Up above uh, Christ there you've got uh, Vyvar uh, avenging the death of his father Odin. Um, and then round on the other side we've got, uh, around this side, two more scenes from pagan mythology. At the bottom there, the uh, devil god Loki uh, being tortured with his faithful wife Siggy, um, tortured by having a, a snake's head placed over his forehead and poison dropping upon him. And then up above, Heimdall, the watchman god with his horn. Uh, and all of this is the story actually of the end of the world of the old Norse gods, the day when the forces of evil would break over the rainbow bridge. And in a great battle, the gods would ultimately be defeated uh, and earthquake and fire would sweep everything away. And all that, you see, alongside a Christian crucifixion. And what the artist and the patron is really trying to bring out of this, I think, is uh, a commentary of one mythology upon Christian teaching. Christ, the end of one world, set against the end of another world, and forward looking towards doomsday. I mean, this cross is asking you to make identities between pagan mythology, Christian teaching, it's making distinctions, it's, ma it's pointing out uh, similarities. And it really does seem to be uh, that this is the way in which the Christian church very rapidly uh, converted the Vikings, 
moving towards their, their teaching. How does it fit in with the uh, um, uh, sort of the history of the, of, of the North as a whole in this period? Well, I think what you can see quite clearly happening at York is that the archbishops there are very rapidly meet, reaching some kind of modus vivendi with the uh, local Viking rulers. Uh, equally, the Viking rulers are anxious to sort of co uh, to, uh, come into Anglo-Saxon society, and they begin, for example, uh, burying their dead within graveyards, you know, doing the normal kind of thing that the Anglo-Saxons do. So they're moving towards the Christian community, the Anglo-Saxon Christians are sort of absorbing these new ideas which are coming in from Scandinavia. Would it actually have looked something like this in, in Viking times? Uh, no, this looks terribly reticent and, and in very good taste. <laughs> but uh, we've, got, uh, we've got evidence, actually, that um, these things were garishly coloured. Reds, blacks, blues. I think he wouldn't have really liked it if you'd seen it uh, back in its original form. I think the great thing about stone sculpture, unlike manuscripts or fine metal work, uh, is that it always has been a public art that people could uh, come and look at. And here, you see, in this churchyard, uh, where it's been for something like 900 years, we've still got a public statement. Inside the church, there are two surviving house-shaped grave markers. These intricately carved stones carry Christian crucifixions and contending waves of armies bound by the twisting coils of the Viking world serpent. With this background, it was natural that Eric Bloodax should have himself and his wife and followers baptized, and that he should journey north of the Tees to seek the protection of the greatest of the northern saints. He came here to Chesterless Street, as Athelstan had done before him. Here, the bones of St. Cuthbert had come to rest after their wanderings from Lindisfarne. Chesterless Street at this time was a jumble of Roman ruins sheltering a cluster of hovels around a wooden church on this site. But it was one of the great holy places in Britain. Here Eric gave presents to the saint and the priests entered his name into their book of remembrance. This remarkable document can still be seen today in the British Library. In return for his goodwill, the priests promised to say masses for him. How long they did so, we don't know. What sort of man was Eric Bloodax? Well, for a lot of the year, he wouldn't have lived in the King's Hall in York. He would have spent his time traveling around his farms and estates to show himself to his friends and to cow his enemies whom he had doubtless had uh, many into submission. 
So let's imagine him traveling to one of those estates, here by the River Tees on the border of his kingdom. This is Conniscliff, the King's Cliff. There's the cliff, and above it, from the 7th century probably, there was a royal residence with the church on top. A rare church it is too, with a unique dedication to the Northumbrian royal Saint Edwin. So this was a special place. And like many royal and noble estates in the Tees Valley, it carried on being used right through the Viking period. The Viking invasions didn't destroy this fabric of life. And there are others similar, Gainford up the river and uh, Sockburn and Aincliff further down. So let's imagine Eric coming here on a beautiful autumn day like this and meeting the local thanes, perhaps the earl who owned these estates, the kind of men who provided Eric with the backing, the military support for his regime. What kind of man did they see? And what virtues were they looking for? Well, later writers in Norway said that Eric was a very big man, brave, strong, impetuous in disposition, but very cruel, unfriendly, and silent. It's a forbidding portrait. And even the poetry from his own time, written by men who were supposed to be praising him, whilst acknowledging that he was generous to his followers, makes no bones about the fact that he was a very hard man who ruled with a fist of iron. It puts one in mind of the Ugandans and Idi Amin. Uh, one imagines that the Northumbrians, in desiring Eric's return, were rather like those Ugandans who today wish for the return of Idi Amin. They know that he's a cruel man but his cruelty is something they can live with. They'd rather have the devil they know than a weak and ineffectual king. So let's leave Eric with an image in a poem by a man who knew him, who said that if you stood before Eric in his royal hall and looked him straight in the eye, you felt fear when, keen as a snake, the eyes of the all-powerful Lord glittered with a fearsome light. But Eric had made implacable enemies. On the coast, a hundred miles north of York, was the residence of his chief rival. Earl Oswulf came from one of the oldest families in the north. He lived in the ancient royal citadel of the northern English, Bamburgh. Originally constructed around 550, beautifully sited and built, as an early traveller said. Bamborough was enclosed by a stockade and rampart and rock-cut ditches, an impregnable refuge of the most powerful clan in the north. They had maintained their supremacy here despite the Vikings. Nal Eric represented too big a threat to them, and so it was to Earl Oswulf of Bamborough that the southern king, Edred, looked to procure Eric's downfall. The events surrounding Eric's fall are mysterious, but the lost York Chronicle shows that Earl Oswulf of Bamborough was able to betray Eric to an alliance of his enemies. To reconstruct these events further, we must turn to the later Norse sagas. Their meeting took place on the heights of the Pennines of the Cumbrian border, a lonely place called Stane Moor. King Eric had so great an army that five kings followed him because he was a valiant man and a battle winner. And he trusted in himself and his force so much that he went deep up country. And there a tributary king of King Edred came against him and a dreadful battle ensued. Many of the English fell. But for every one who fell, three came in his place out of the countryside around. And as the evening came on, the loss of men turned against the Norsemen, and many were killed. And there fell Eric with his sons and brothers and all his army. Our last day has dawned. By the head of my dead leader, I will die cut down. So whosoever gazes on the pile of our corpses may see how we repaid our Lord for all the gold he gave us. 
Thus it is right that the chief warriors should be undismayed and fall embracing their illustrious king in companionship. The annal in the Lost York Chronicle which tells of Eric's death is brief, but there's no mistaking the sympathy of the author. Rex Ericus, in quadam solitudine quae Stainmore dicitur. King Eric, in a certain lonely place called Stainmore, with his son Harek and his brother Ragnald, betrayed by Earl Osulf, was fraudulently, treacherously killed by Earl Macus. And from then on in these parts, King Edred ruled. The story of Eric's betrayal was certainly current and certainly in this chronicle because even a writer in Hamburg in Germany in the following years had a, a similar version. But there's still mystery surrounding it. We don't really know the events which led up to the, the battle on Stainmoor, but there it is. And it's quite clear that within a short time people in Northumbria uh, knew that that was really the end of the independent Northumbrian kingdom. Archbishop Wolfstan was then released from captivity and restored to a bishopric at Dorchester in the south of England. He was never allowed back up north. And in fact, he died and was buried at Oundle, where St. Wilfred had died, a northerner to the core. And so the chronicle ends at that point with the death of Eric and followed his death with the list of the kings of Northumbria, of whom Eric was the last. And the chronicler noted at the end that from then on, the Northumbrians continued to lament the loss of their kings and the end of the ancient liberty which they had once enjoyed. And of course, some of them still feel that way. And so the career which had blazed across northern history from the White Sea to Spain ended in the lurid glow of funeral pyres on the wild heights above Westmoreland. But to which heaven would he ascend, this artist of war? The Christian paradise or the pagan hall of heroes? His wife, Gunhild, had no doubt. The memorial poem she commissioned shows Eric, hot foot from the battle on Stainmoor, his death wounds displayed, greeted in Valhalla by Odin, the king of the old gods. Hail to new Eric, Gaki Hall Horsk. Welcome, great one, come into the hall. Welcome, we know you well and your famous deeds. On the top of Stainmore today, by the side of the A66, is the stump of an Anglo-Saxon figured cross. Could it be that Eric's Christian sympathizers in York had it carved to commemorate their king in their way? If it is, this forgotten fragment is one of the strangest monuments in Britain. Next Tuesday at 4.55, Michael Wood goes in search of the truth behind the legend of Ethelred the Unready.